Okay. We will start it two minutes in the class on combustion. I like to see some questions combustion. So here it is. And we'll discuss a little bit later about this flame. So think about it. What kind of combustion is it? Multi-phase, single phase. Phase. Rest fuel. Okay, let's start with the class. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's start. Um, so today is the last day before the Christmas holidays. Um, today we discuss about combustion. So you last week you had two classes from Vera Popovich about uh, mechanical material aspect. So it was a little bit different subject like we discuss now. Um, I hope you learned a lot from it. I hope you enjoyed the lectures. I, I partly watched some lectures and I really enjoyed them because I think it's a lot of important knowledge for the gas device, really to make the high temperatures capable to make it capable to run on the high temperatures. Uh, today, we're going to discuss how to make the high temperatures in a gas turbine, and it will be done by combustion. So let's start today. We, we only will give a brief in the introduction on combustion. Combustion is a very broad uh, scientific topic, and uh, we really will touch onto the basics. There are more classes and courses, so I will introduce one class from uh, uh, aerospace engineering, there they have more background on combustion. I re also recommend a book on combustion. So if you want to know more about combustion, please uh, look better. So what do I want you to do after the day? The first thing is really to understand the role of combustion in the gas to mine cycle. So uh, via the combustion, we, we add the external energy. We, ex we add uh, chemical energy to the cycle via heat. Um, and that's really the role, the role of combustion in the cycle. But I really want you to understand what, how it works. Uh, some important aspects of gas turbine combustion will be with dimension here, stability, emissions, and efficiency. Then we'll discuss about typical gas turbine uh, combustion configuration and why people make choices like that. And then we go a little bit deeper in the combustion theory. So uh, we discuss the different flame types. So the basic distinction is actually between non-premixed and premixed turbulent and laminar. And a very important aspect in combustion equivalence ratio, adiabatic flame temperature, stoichiometric adiabatic flame temperature, stability and oxidation. So we will briefly touch upon them. You will be able to do some basic calculations, uh, but for further our discussion, we only have one class of combustion this year. So it will only briefly touch the surface. That is the content about today. So the combustion in the gas to one cycle, combustion configuration theory, and then we'll go a little bit about uh, combustion design emissions, combustion efficiency cooling, and if we have some time left, or we can look at two interesting topics for gas turbine combustion. So first of all is uh, combustion dynamics. So the, the, the slides are included. So there's a an, uh, an, uh, uh, loop between the combustion and the acoustics in the combustion chamber. And for, well, especially modern gas turbine system, this is one of the main challenges of uh, combustion at the moment. And the other one is, well, active future uh, application of gas turbines. And it really has to do with hydrogen combustion. So we will discuss them as extra potential lectures.
Okay, let's start. Um, so if you really want to have some more uh, background, I can recommend uh, the two, two things. I think there are a lot of good books, the books on combustion, but for gas turbine combustion, you have the book from Arthur Leverve. Uh, so that's a really good book about the practical applications of, of, of combustion in gas turbines. Uh, they have the third edition, uh, but I think that's a good book for gas turbine combustion, introduction to gas turbine combustion. There are a lot of other uh, combustion theory books. And if you want to have some more background, I also can recommend the course given by uh, Professor Rukaerts, Arvind Rao, and uh, Dr. Bolin, from, uh, but the later two are from aerospace engineering, so it's combustion for propulsion and power technologies. I think it's a very cute course. I think it starts next quarter, but it, it's really want to have some more background in combustion, please uh, follow that course. And if you have questions, yeah, you can contact me. No, not nowadays in the in the building, but really on uh, remote. But you can send me an email if you have more questions about combustion. So let's start a little bit back. So what's the role of gas to, of, of uh, combustion in the gas turbine cycle? Now, we know this this system here. So we start on this side where we have the compression. So we compress the air in the gas turbine. So we only have a high pressure and an intermediate air temperature. And then very important here is the heating. So in a gas turbine cycle or all terminal length cycles, we have to heat up the, the medium. And in a gas turbine that happens via combustion. So combustion is actually the release of chemical energy into thermal energy. So the conversion actually of chemical into thermal energy. That, that's what happened in combustion. And uh, by that conversion of chemical into thermal, you get the high temperature required to get uh, the e efficient expansion. So you get expansion in turbine and to drive the compressor and some net power left. So important here is really the conversion of chemical energy into thermal energy. And thermal energy is necessary to drive this thermodynamic cycle. So if you look at combustion in a GT perspective, actually uh, it's thermodynamic. So it's the, the heat addition to the system and also to reach a thermal inner temperature. And if you look like, okay, so that's the thermodynamic cycle. So what's, what's requ required from that? And then if you want to have combustion in a gas turbine, you need stability uh, also for land engines, especially for air engines. So you want to, don't want to lose the combustion because then you'd lose the thrust. And it's, it's very risky. So stability is very important. Efficiency and performance. So you want to have you want to have the, the fuel 100% combusted. That's the high efficiency. And some other performance parameters. We'll come back to that later. And then you have the emissions. You want to have low emissions. So uh, part of the emissions are coupled to the fuel. So if you have carbon in the fuel, you will always have CO2. Uh, if you have hydrogen in fuel, we'll always have the water, water vapor, because the combustion with oxygen. Uh, but next to that, uh, one of the main issues for, for fuels we apply in gas turbines are NOx emissions, so nitric oxide emissions. And uh, so that, that also has to be controlled. So if you really want to have combustion engine, uh, combustion theory, it's all focused on these aspects, which stability, efficiency, and emissions. Uh, we come back to the gas turbine cycle, like we show the compressor, very pressurized, where we add heat via combustion and turbine work. And this is how it generally looks here down in the, uh, um, in, in the gas turbine. So you have here the, the compressor and you have here the combustor in between and then the turbine. So here you have the highest temperature ferry. ferry. And well, we go a little, 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 little bit more into detail about uh, this kind of type of combustors. Important to know if you really look at um, uh, combustion in thermodynamic cycle, and you can really see it in the TS diagram. So uh, in the in the compressor and the turbine, you only have a very small increase in the uh, entropy. So here's the idle cycle. In reality, it will go a little bit to the right because you've also increased in entropy. But what you really see is if you go from two to three. That's really the highest contribu contribution to uh, entropy increase. And that's actually because you uh, convert chemical energy into high temperature 
with heat release. And that's converted actually to the heat release, to the heat temperatures linked to this cycle. So therefore you get the high entropy in, in uh, entropy increase. Back to the high entropy increase uh, means irreversibility. Irreversibility, and that you see it very clearly in, in, in combustion, that's irreversible. You can't turn it back. You can't turn the, the, uh, uh, the, the high gases in the system back into fuel. So that's the irreversibility. So that's very important to know. This is really the main attribute to, to, to the irreversibility and there to, to, to the loss in the cycle. So combustion, if you really want to do something in, in the cycle, well, you can, for example, apply fuel cell, high temperature fuel cell, so you first convert the chemical industry, industry energy into power and the remainder, the heat is used in such a cycle. But okay, this combustion, it's an important role. It's really the, the, the energy contributed to the, the gas to mass cycle. Some combustor configurations. Well, this is typical uh, air engine, if you look turbofan, fan, so the, the big fan driven by the low pressure turbine, you can hear the, uh, the low pressure compressor and the low pressure, uh, um, sorry, the low pressure, uh, uh, the high pressure compressor, and see here the combustors in between. It's really very small. The big advance, if you have high pressure, of course, uh, you have small uh, volume flow there, and also very, very, make it very compact. Uh, if you look like an industrial engine, it looks comparable, compressor, and here you have the compressor in between. That's very good here. So if you look for the trend, you can zoom it in, and there it's really very small, those combustion things. And actually, if you think that all the heat release, so all the energy takes place in this very small location. So that is really, if you would consider it, it is like a hurricane, it's like a flame in a hurricane. It's about 100 meters per second, the typical velocity of such a combustor, uh, to 100 meters per second uh, with a very high intense heat release. So there, it's really very important to control that, with that high heat release in, the, in that, that, that small combustor. But you get a very high concentrated heat release in such a situation. Now, this is the, the, the first combustor designed by Riddle. And actually, um, it's not that different as, as nowadays uh, uh, combustors. They more or less look the same. So how does it look like? So you have here a, a combustor chamber or a liner. And uh, on the inside, of course, that's exposed to the hot gases. And uh, therefore, you have to cool it. And the best way to cool it is to have cold of cooling air from the compressor flowing at the other side of the liner. So you directly cool this liner and the other advantage you heat up this air a little bit. So that's actually very still a standard design where you have a liner with airflow around it. The combustion air flows around the liner and cools the liner. Then the air makes a 180 degrees turn and enters here into the combustor. And at the uh, end of the combustor, you have all kinds of uh, the fuel injectors where you add the fuel, and then it flows in some way <coughs> into the turbine. And then you have some uh, more air dilution air holes or cooling air holes to really cool this liner and to reach the right inlet temperature for the turbine. This is really what you see for the for also for modern combustion is the air flows at the outside of the liner to cool the liner, makes 180 degrees turn and goes into the combustor. And this one here at the end are dilution holes. And uh, we can we come back to later what the role is of this dilution holes is really to keep the right inner temperature for the compressor and to distribute the air between uh, uh, combustion and cooling. So this is the, 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 the riddle combustor. Well, this actually, this is like we, we just discussed, this the, the riddle of the combustion where you have uh, the air flowing around the liner, made in 180 degrees, sorry, made in the 180 degrees turn and goes with fuel and combust. Partly of the air goes to the holes in the liner to really uh, cool or to, to for, for dilution air. You also have this type of combustion straight too that is less applied uh, because you, can, you really don't have the cooling of the liner. The big advantage of, of, of this one is that you have the cooling of the liner uh, by the airflow, if you have the refresh flow. They have a number of configurations. 
So you have actually uh, an, an analog combustor. So that's actually where you have a kind of donut around your, your, your gas turbine. So it's both applied in, in aero engines and a number of industrial engines. In most industrial engines, they now apply CAN or tubular combustion. So all these, all these liners, these are the liners. Uh, so the outer of the combustion chamber and the, the air is flowing between this dotted line and the solid line. And then you have a combination of both. These, uh, the first one are the most applied in, in nowadays gas turbines. So there's about uh, 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 60 technologies and what you really see around here is really those cooling holes and dilution holes. You get the same here uh, from the from the 70s, the air sheet in, in flow also. So the air coming from the 60s design, so much in the air, air flowing from the compressor, there's the fuel injector and it flows into this. So all these holes, we come back to later to all these holes, which is also these louvers and there's really, if you look like these louvers, they supply a small air film on the combustor liner to cool the combustor liner. They have this shape. That's really to cool down. Uh, um, I got a question. What configuration has best performance? Um, <laughs> that's not easy to say. It really depends on the situation. Uh, I come back, uh, Thomas, I come back to that later, to that question later, why you have a different configuration. There's no single answer to the question, what configuration has the best performance? I come back to that later. It really has to do with the amount of uh, area to be cooled and uh, the stability of the flames. So if you have a number of items to, to be solved here, to be discussed here. So we come to next to the ones, next slide. This is about uh, the 70 design. There's more the annular uh, situations in here. So you have here the, the, all the, 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 uh, the burners. You have here the annular combustor. If you look like uh, the industrial type of burners, so this, for example, is uh, applied in, in, in uh, uh, the Siemens gas turbines from the last decade. And there you see there's an annular combustor. It's also part in the, the Alstom gas turbines, where you have those uh, burners here they inject the fuel and flow around uh, this analog combustor, kind of donut. You have here the, 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 this is really technologies mainly from the 80s, mainly from the 80s, where you have the big silo combustors. So uh, there the air flows come from the compressor, flows from the outside of the silo combustor, turns around and goes here. So the big advantage of this silo combustor is that they have a large volume. So you can also burn fuels with uh, a lower uh, flame speed. So low calorific fuels and things like that, because you have a large volume and a large residence time in the combustor, and then it goes around here into the into the turbine. The big, big disadvantage is you have quite a complicated system here with this it's a flow around here. Uh, this is also actually this is for the this Siemens design. It's the Ansaldo uh, GE design, from Alstom design, and you see it again here. So the flow comes from the uh, uh, compressor like here flows around the liner and makes the 180 turn degrees and here is the burner and then it goes into the um, goes into the, into the into the turbine again and it's uh, if you did is a, a, a curve through of a kind of um, uh, anywhere combustor and then you have here this the, the can system so this is an example of uh, of a GE DLN 2.6 but uh, Mitsubishi has it Siemens in the modern gas turbines also has it and what you see here is the air flows uh, here around uh, from, from the compressor, makes this turn and flows between this flow sieve and the liner. So in that way it cools the liner, makes 180 degrees turn here. Then you have here the, the burners. So the burners there you inject the fuel, you get the flame here and the flame goes into the, uh, into the, um, into the turbine with, with the transition piece. So what configuration has the best performance? Actually, uh, most, um, uh, most uh, customer manufacturers nowadays apply this, the, the can type combustor. It really has to deal with, uh, there's a number of advantages. So they are easily to be replaced. So uh, you can really design them for a high temperature. If you have the very complex one, they cannot be replaced. You have all kinds of tiles for prevention, so that it makes it more complex, so it can easily be replaced. 
the other thing is really you have to uh, to um, see what's the minimum to be cooled surface because the liner always have a surface versus the volume. So actually you want to have a minimum surface to be cooled. Well, in the annular combustion, the surface to be cooled is a little bit less than in the uh, in, with, in all the liners combustor. Uh, but, uh, well, you see, for example, this also at times very complex to cool the surface. And here, because you can replace those liners uh, after, well, 16,000 hours or 32,000 hours, depends on the design. And that way, you can easily better do that. An other advantage of using such a can type combustor is that you really can uh, test one can. So, if you then really, so that's really for uh, development of the system, it's cheaper. To develop one can. In this case, you really have to test a complete uh, analog combustor. So most nowadays, most gas turbines apply uh, the, the, the newest versions this can type combustor. So what's the best performance? So question to the tone: What has the best performance? They all have the advantages and disadvantages. But for the high performance, you normally apply now these or the analog. Sometimes applied for the um, um, for the aircraft, most annular is, is applied because this is, you can make it uh, lighter than a can type combustor. It has more material involved and there's less material involved, also combined to the cooling surface. So how does such a can type combustor look like with some typical IDs? So you get the flow from the compressor, so it's placed somewhere in, an, in, in a dome where you have the flow from the compressor. Then the compressor flow enters here between the liner. So the combustor is combustion takes place inside this one. So the air from the compressor flows between this liner. So it's acted the combustor wall and a flow sleeve. And there are some normally there are some uh, holes for to, 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 to control the flow. So this is the flow sleeve that's on the outside here. Inside is the liner, so it flows here. Then it makes 180 turns degree. You inject the fuel here and you get the combustion here. So if you look like this one, this, this, this liner is inside the flow sleeve, then you have the, the end cover, and then it goes into a transition piece. So the transition piece is the transition between the combustor and the turbine. And all these pieces has to be cooled. So you see, for example, uh, this one, that the combustor, that the liner is cooled by the co-flowing air. Uh, for the transition piece, you also have to apply some cooling. So like with turn barrier coating and things like that, discussed last classes by, by, by Vera. So what do we want to have with combustion uh, chamber requirements? So first of all, we want to have low emissions, uh, both directly from fuel and also NOx. We'll come back to it later. So we want to have complete combustion. Uh, this is especially relevant, well, also for, for natural gas combustion, but especially relevant for liquid fuel combustion. We want to have a minimum pressure drop because uh, um, you want to have a minimum pressure drop. Uh, there, I see the question now popping up. You have a minimum pressure drop uh, because um, yeah, you want to perform that affects performance. The other factor is the pattern factor enters to the turbine. So at the outlet of the combustor, you have a certain uh, profile of the temperature. And that profile of the temperature should match the turbine inlet. Uh, blades, a uh, fan, sorry, the, the, the nozzles. So also the cooling of the turbine inlet and the, the, the material composition and design of the turbine inlet should be matched with the pattern factor of the um, uh, at the outlet of the combustor. So normally it's a little bit colder at the wall and high in the center, the high temperature at the outlet of the combustor, and it should match the turbine design. The lifetime and maintainability. The cost that's important, of course. So you want actually from an operated point of view, you want to have a, have a long life and a good maintainability. The cost, stable combustion, no blow off, no flashback. We come back to that later. Important one here is for it's also a requirement for air engines combustion is the altitude to be light, and then you have to have to wait. We got a question here: the 180 degrees surely creates a lot of pressure loss. Do air engines have used straight flow? Uh, the 180 degrees 
give some pressure loss, but not too many. So that's normally not a limiting factor for the combustor. So um, it has normally the 180 degrees had more advantages than disadvantages. On the 180 degrees turn of the airflow, has normally more advantages than disadvantages. So it, it gets some pressure loss, but also you need a little bit of pressure loss to stay, have stable combustion. Uh, what we saw just in all the aero engines uh, we saw from the past, they normally had straight through flow. Uh, with the increasing temperatures, that's not possible anymore. So that's more than from the 80s and the 90s, or so 70s and the 80s. The current uh, aero engines also have partly uh, reverse flow. It also has to do with the cooling. It's a balance between it. There's no one, like, there's no one subject you can optimize up. Uh, you, you have in such a combustion, you have to optimize on different aspects. So cooling, airflow, the, the distribution, uh, pressure drop. And therefore, uh, that, that really de depend, makes the design of the combustor. OK, this is the important one. And actually, you will see this in all the uh, experts going back. So for complete combustion, you need three items, fuel, oxidizer, and temperature at the same time. Because to be uh, sure, combustion finally takes place at a molecular level. So the oxygen molecule has to meet the fuel molecule, and then there are also kind of radicals, and there has to be the right temperature. So that's very important. But at this molecular level, you have the right fuel, the right oxidizer, and the right temperature, also the mar <coughs> at the right condition to get combustion. So if you can create this, you can have stable and good combustion. And this is really the trick to get this composition at the locations we want in our system. So if you look a little bit like combustion science, it's a combination of a lot of things come together. So first of all, it's chemical reactions. So that is very, very important. So uh, we act fuel with oxidizer and therefore we get heat release. So chemical kinetics is very important. They really determine the rate of combustion combined with the other ones. Then you get thermochemistry because you get heat release. That's important. And that heat release links to the heat transfer, both for heating up and also to get a little heat, heat loss. And important in this whole system is that combustion normally takes place in a flow because, yeah, you normally have a flow because otherwise you, the combustion would stop. You have to have fresh, fresh oxidized and fresh, fresh, fresh fuel. So with fluid mechanics, you always have this combined. And all these things interact and make combustion such a complex and interesting topic to study. So you all have to need this one and understand all these four items and or especially the interaction between those four items to, to, to better understand combustion. And therefore, you all see on all these aspects, you have different groups in all the world working on all these aspects and working together for better understanding of combustion. Important, yeah, this is important, like I discussed. And uh, at the end of the, uh, yeah, at the end of today, I really want you to understand these terms. So they will also be used in the, the exam. We come back to the later, stoichiometric combustion, equivalent ratio, heat of reaction, adiabatic flame temperature. We briefly discuss about the Warby index and the flame speed. So these are some important aspects, some important terms used in combustion science. I would like you to understand and to, to see what we're doing with them. I will share my screen now, wait a minute. Um, oh. So stoichiometric combustion, and this is an important one. So like in the sample, the standard fuel we have is CH4 plus O2, CO2 plus H2O. So we can combine them. So you have two H, so you have one C, there's one C, you have uh, four H's, so you get here two. So we also need Two or two. So just this is the standard uh, uh, chemical equation for combustion that takes place at the combustion plus heat release. And that's important, we got the heat. And for the gas turbine, we're mainly interested in this. Now, the first thing we see actually, because you have to see here, you also get CO2 combustion. So 
always when you have C in your fuel, you will have CO2 combustion. You will have CO2 also in your, you will also have CO2 generation. So the only thing you can't prevent uh, CO2, the only thing you can't prevent CO2 emissions if you don't have fuels with C. And they're just actually, they're just a few. One of them are hydrogen and nitrogen. Oh, sorry, sorry, hydrogen and ammonia. Those are most famous fuels without the C. So if you want to prevent CO2, you have to use another fuel. But okay, in most cases, we discussed about natural gas combustion, so may methane combustion. What is stoichiometric? So the stoichiometric ratio is just this, this uh, chemical equation. So the stoichiometric ratio metric is we need one mole H2 or CH4, sorry, CH4 and two mole O2. So that is really the stoichiometric ratio of CH4 versus O2. Well, the normal we don't have O2, but O2 is part of the air. So normally, so you need T2 mole O2 per mole CH4. Well, if you have 21% O2 in air, you get two divided by one minus S2 uh, divided by 0.79 is um, then you need about, uh, well, we can do the calculation. Um, no, sorry, 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 this is not good. This is not good, my apologies. That was about 10 mole air per mole CH4. And this is really the stoichiometric amount of air per mole CH4. So this all executed per mole, but the reality, of course, in this case, we work in kilogram per kilogram. So one mole CH4 is uh, 60 gram, and we can do the same for air. I think then we have the numbers about 28. We have the same exact number. Yeah, one mole air is um, 28.97 gram. And then we can compute this can So this means that actually, so we have one mole CH4, it's 16 gram CH4. We don't have exactly uh, 10, but actually it was 9.5 mole air is 9.5 times uh, 28.97 gram of air. And that actually means that we have then we can compute the, the then we can calculate the fuel air ratio. Air ratio, fuel air ratio is M fuel divided by M air. In this case is 16 divided by 9.5 times seven. And that is 0 0.058. Okay, let's go back to this number. So I think this is the conclusion we have. So actually we means that per kilogram so per kilogram CH4, we have O point, sorry, per kilogram air, sorry about it, we have also declared, per kilogram air, we have O point O five kilogram CH4. So you see that actually you only have, if you have at stoichiometric condition, so you have just enough air and just enough fuel to complete the reaction. You only have well, 58 grams of CH4 per kilogram of air. So there's quite a difference in, in magnitude. So this is really the, this, so this is the stoichiometric
dual air ratio. This is an important one. So this is for CS4, you can do it for all kinds of fuels. Uh, I think it's good to, to do it a little bit yourself, but that's important. So this is the stoichiometric fuel air ratio. So that is 0 0.058 kilogram CH4 per kilogram air. What we do now is actually also you can have the equivalence ratio. And the equivalent ratio is actually is calculated actually is the fuel air ratio divided by fuel air ratio stoichiometric. So this state of fuel air ratio is uh, M fuel divided by M air, and that is uh, M air stoichiometric M fuel stoichiometric. So what is the equivalence ratio? And the symbol for the equivalence ratio is phi. So that's the fuel air ratio first fuel air ratio stoichiometric. So if the phi is larger than one, then fuel air ratio is larger than fuel air ratio stoichiometric. That means that you have more fuel than for the stoichiometric combustion. So you have an excess of fuel. Fuel. And if phi smaller than one, your actual fuel air ratio is below you than your stoichiometric fuel air ratio. So you have an excess of air. Does anybody has an idea? What do we have in gas turbines? We normally have this phi larger than one, or will we have this one? What do would we have? Yeah, I see some answer less than one, much smaller, less than one. Yeah, so this is very important. So we normally have this one. So we have an excess of air. So we have um, more air than required for stoichiometric combustion. So that, that's that's important and it's happy because otherwise you have, if you, have, if you would have worked on this one situation, you would have extra fuel. So you won't not combust all the fuel. So that's important to know if you have a fee larger than one, you don't combust all the fuel. You have a lack of air to combust all the fuel. And this is an important, two important items. The equivalence ratio really determines where you are in, in, in uh, yeah, it depends on the situation. So if you have equivalent ratio one, you are the stoichiometric conditions and you have the ideal condition for complete combustion. And below are a little smaller than when you have an excess of air and higher than when you have an uh, excess of fuel. There's an other, um, yeah, the, the terms and terminology linked to that is actually if you have uh, smaller than one, you have lean combustion. And if you are larger than one, you have rich combustion. So lean is really you have too much air, you have an excess of air. There's an other term and that's actually um, lambda. And that is the, uh, that's a more the German and it's actually uh, the air factor. So that's actually, um, this is M air divided by M air stoichiometric. So it's the amount of air you above the air, the stoichiometric ratio. So if you, for example, have uh, uh, one kilogram of CH4, then M air stoichiometric is one divided by, well, the fuel air ratio is one divided by FR stoichiometric. And, uh, um, and so, 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 and so, so if your mass flow of air is, for example, two, is, for example, uh, so it's about, sorry, no, it's about mass flow, sorry is one over, one over 0 0.05, so that's about uh, 16, 16, 17 kilogram of air. So you need about 70 kilogram of air per kilogram CH4. And if your mass flow is air 34, 34 kilogram, then so your lambda is two. <coughs> you 
now actually it will go with flow. So actually do it all in kilogram per second. But this is the idea is the excess of air. And like uh, we just said, um, well, actually also in gas turbines, your lambda will normally be larger than one. Okay, I'll show my color screen again. Wait a minute. Uh, there it is, yeah. Uh, mm. so we have a stoichiometric we just discussed, but it's important aspect. Stoichiometric, that's an important aspect we I'd like to discuss with you. That the then we have the, the X of errors, the lambda. The air, the, the air rate show. Then we come to the next item, and it's the heat of reaction. <coughs> so if you look at the total entropy, so the total entropy is a combination of the chemical entropy and the sensible entropy. And if you go from the reactants, and this, in our case, from the CH4 plus O2, this is the total entropy from then, and you go to the products, so that's CO2 and H2O, you get the same total entropy, so the total entropy doesn't change, but you convert the chemical entropy into heat, so you get an increase in temperature. This is the situation here. And that's chemical heat release. So the heat of reaction is a little bit uh, high school, uh, uh, high school uh, chemistry, so it's the, the total energy in the projects minus the uh, total energy in the reactants. So the reactants are in this out case, the seeds for the O2, the products. Well, you can all get all these numbers from all kinds of sources. You know the stoichiometric ratio we just discussed. And if you work that out in this case, so per mole CH4, we can look at these tables. And important is to see here, if you do it on a, on a gaseous situation, you get per mole CH4, you see you have 802 kilojoule per mole heat release. And if you go to a uh, liquid, you get 890. This is important to notice that you for all case, in case uh, water is formed or H2O is formed in your reaction, you always have two uh, numbers of the heat of reaction, either with H2O as gas, and either with uh, H2O as liquid. <coughs> Does anybody know what, what, what would we use normally for gas turbine uh, calculations? Do, would we use the above one, where we keep the H2O as gas, or do, you use, do, do will we use the lower one, where we use the H2O as liquid? Does anybody know what we would use? Yeah, normally we use H2O as gas. So that's the gas one, it's the lower heating value. You always see this, the lower heating value. Why is how low heat value? Because you have a, a lower value out of it. And that is really, and with liquid, there you make extra, extra heat uh, from condensation uh, to water. There's one trick. Uh, so we know technical people together. So you normally work with this one as a gas. If you want to buy gas, you have to pay the gas versus the higher. So the, where you condense the water, they include the energy from the condensation of water. So there you work with a higher heating value. But this is in kilojoule per mole. Well, we can convert that back, of course, to, to uh, kilojoule per kilogram. To that here. So you get here for methane, well, we just do if the 802 divided by the 16 we just had. Uh, the mole mass of, 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 uh, of CH4, we end up with 50. And do the same for the high heating value, we come to 56, around that 55.5 in reality. So if you look at methane, well, the heating value is uh, 50 to 55. It's about 10% difference between the lower and the higher heating value. Natural gas, yeah, that's common. That's a mixture of mainly methane, but also nitrogen and so higher carbon. So these are typical numbers for, for natural gas. We range between, depending on where it's coming from. So here you see a 10% in methane, see about 10% uh, difference between LHV and H uh, higher heating value. For hydrogen, 
it's uh, um, yeah we we see where we have only a, we have H2 to uh, water, so it's quite a difference between those two of them. Uh, and the main difference, of course, there there's much more water in it. Relatively, there's much more water in it, so you get much more relatively condensation condensation heat available. Diesel, you see, there's very limited water in it. The hydrogen, uh, hydrogen things in it, same like kerosene is comparable. Um, another thing you notice here is if you look at the hydrogen, so the lot of discussion is hydrogen as fuel. It has a very high, it's quite actually the, the calorific value in kilogram, it's about well two to three times, two and a half times higher than for, for natural gas or from for methane. But actually, what's not included here is the, the density. So in volume, so in kilogram it's a higher uh, higher uh, heat content, but in volume it has a much lower heat content. So it makes it a challenge with hydrogen. And then you have some low calorific gases, sink gas as well. They normally have four to six to all kinds like that. So this is really important, the lower heating value, the higher heating value. And then uh, we can work with the adiabatic flame temperature. And then you see uh, this heat of reaction, um, you can calculate that gives to the, uh, that actually uh, gives to the, to, to the temperature increase. And we can make that sum, we can make the calculation here. So we have again this situation here, plus auto So we have uh, two auto two. So this is situation here. We get well, we got the lower heating value. So we got stoichiometric combustion. And we are derived that we have fuel air ratio is 0.058. Yeah. So this, okay, so this per kilogram air, kilogram air, we have 0.058 kilogram CH4. We have the LHV is 50 megajoule per kilogram. And we can make an energy balance. So what is entropy in? So assume one kilogram of fuel. So we have H in. And we also assume that the temperature, assume one kilogram fuel, H in chemical is 50 kilojoule per kilogram. We also have the uh, sensible entropy is Cp times T minus T zero times the mass. So if you look like here, we have here a combustor, we got M in, H in, and we got M out and H out. So the H in, well, we know 50 uh, fish chemicals and sensible chemical and sensible. And sensible, like you said, is actually, uh, well, we can have to calculate that this uh, uh, is uh, Cp times delta T. If we show a constant temperature difference, is Cp T minus T zero. Sensible if you assume a constant Cp. Otherwise, you have to take the integral we just saw here. Now we can make the calculation a little bit further. So we have here M in. So that is um, actually the same as M out, but that is uh, one kilogram CH4 and one divided by 0.05 kilogram air. To calculate it back. Um, that's about uh, 17.2 kilogram air. 
So M out is 18.2 kilogram. H in, well, assume that the uh, chemicals get the 50 kilojoule, megajoule per kilogram. So 50 megajoule per kilogram is LHV from, uh, is the LHV of soy CH4. And a sensible T is T zero. So then we have here an inner temperature of, of zero. So then we have, so then we have the sensible entropy is, is zero. So the H total in is 50,000 kilojoule. And the M out, there we have the chemical entropy is zero. So then we have mass times Cp times T minus T zero is 50,000 equal to the inlet entropy. So we know the mass, 18.5. Well, you get a, we can assume for Cp, for example, uh, 1.2 in this case, you can guess that in your calculation. Then you get a T minus T zero is the 50, is 50,000. And if you work that out, you see that T is uh, 23.9 C. Important in this assumption, and that's actually where we assume it to be. So this is the stoichiometric, stoichiometric adiabatic flame temperature. And this is an important concept. Stoichiometric means, well, we have the ideal reaction. So we have the just, uh, just the right amount of CH4 and just the right, the right amount of air. Adiabatic means we don't have heat loss. So actually the inlet entropy is equals the outlet entropy. And then we get the flame temperature. That's really all the heat of reaction is converted into heat. So we go back to this equation again, where it is. Well, we assume here the one per T, this numbers that we have, do we, do we have here, so we can work this out in this situation here. So, and you see 22.9. So in this case, the adiabatic stoichiometric flame temperature of methane is 2300 C in this year situations. There are some implications, of course. So we assume here Cp to be constant. Well, this is uh, clear. This one is the main assumption that we assume Cp to be constant. But this in reality, otherwise you have to do it with the integral. And this is an important point, how you can calculate the adiabatic flame temperature. Um, then a question uh, to all of you. If you, so this is at phi is one, equivalence ratio is one. What happens with the adiabatic flame temperature if we go to situations with phi below, below one? What happens with the adiabatic flame temperature if we go to equivalence ratios? Yeah, it goes down. And yeah, that's important because that happens actually if you go to lower equivalence ratio, you have an excess of air. And what happens in this formula, if you see like this formula, you get here. This is in a stoichiometric situation, but if you have a phi lower than one, this number will increase. You get more, more uh, medium to heat up. And because you have more helium, uh, medium to heat up, you get the same inlet entropy. The 17.2 will, will increase, and therefore you will have a lower flame temperature. There's a question why after that? Uh, why at in the T, T0 is T, T0? No, actually it's not stated here that T0 is T0. At this case, in this example, this is a question from Matteo. Why at the end that T is T0 is zero? No, that's not true. What I assume is in this case, always in entropy, you have to work with a reference temperature. You always cal calculate the, the entropy First, a reference temperature. We do it here. You also, that, that also how you do it with an entropy uh, calculation. It's Cp minus 
uh, sorry, she peaked times t minus t reference. The assumption here is that your start reaction, so the inlet of the combustor, you are at a reference temperature. That's why you can uh, strike it through. Uh, but normally you really have to calculate the, the entropy versus the reference temperature. But this situation with phi smaller than one, so you have an excess of air. What happens if you have a phi larger than one? So an excess of fuel, what happens in that case with the, uh, um, with the stoichiometric flame temperature? Does anybody know that? Yeah, because that goes down again. Yeah, because you still have an excess of fuel and it also added up to this one because you still have then unburnt fuel but that will uh, partly uh, take place in a 17.2, so you get a higher amount of mass to be heated up with the same amount of heat release. So that's true. So this is really, if you look like, um, um, uh, these are the concentrations, well, you see here the concentrations for the different situations. Uh, maybe I've done flame temperature, this flame temperature, we go first to this one. So this is the equivalence ratio for the flame temperature. So you have the highest flame temperature, actually, uh, theoretically, like we just discussed, it should be highest at the uh, uh, equivalence ratio one. In reality, because of equilibrium, we come back to that later, it shifts a little bit to slightly higher flame temperature, the higher uh, equivalence ratio. So you see with methane, methane is quite a moderate one, we just calculated it here. And then uh, propane, C4 is high, there's CO, acetylene. So that's are really the flame temperatures here. And what you see here, if you go back, you see if you go, this is a kind of uh, chemical equilibrium calculations executed here. And you see here that also the, the, the products reach their maximum at the, at the, at the, at the, at the stoichiometric ratio. Uh, see, high, high, um, sort of water a little bit on the white side, a little bit higher equivalent ratio, and CO a little bit lower. So these are the products that are the highest, and you see that the, the reactants are lowest, of course, at equivalent ratio. So on this side, you have an excess of air lower, so you keep CO, you keep O2 oxygen available, and here you have an excess of fuel. And in this case, uh, yeah, you don't have full combustion. So you have a uh, combustion in, in between. You have intermediate products. So that CO and hydrogen and eating intermediate products uh, that don't combust completely. You see about here. And that results because of this chemical equilibrium, you see that the adiabatic flame temperature slips a little bit to high equivalent ratios. And this question, this next plot uh, links a little bit to the other question uh, we just had. So what happens if you have a higher inlet temperature, for example, here? Um, I, can, I, will first discuss this. I see a question, but I first will discuss this. If you have a higher inlet temperature, actually, well, you have a shift in the, 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 the adiabatic flame temperature. The adiabatic flame temperature will also be higher. So the higher the inlet temperature, the higher uh, the adiabatic flame temperature. It's not a one-to-one -one relation because you have the, 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 the change. We assume now constant CP, CP change a little bit, and you also have a different change in equilibrium, but you get, in principle, you get just the same amount of uh, temperature in, 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 the, in the adiabatic flame temperature. So here you see the difference if you took an other in that temperature in this case. Um, the question is why is there still a little bit uh, CO2 at uh, stoichiometric one? I'm going to come to this one in a minute here. Um, you see a little bit CO, and it really has to do with equilibrium. So this is uh, this is a set of equations, and in the equilibrium between all these equations, um, it, it there's still a little bit, little bit left because there's an equilibrium re reaction. If you have the simple reaction with that equilibrium, and we assume one step reaction and it all consumes, so no equilibrium, but everything consumes then it should be fully zero here. Because, but because of the chemical equilibrium between all these species, you have a little bit O2 left here. We can also have not fully all the CO2 to calculate here. So for example, if you look at these dotted lines, this would be the frozen equilibrium. In this case, you would have a complete reaction. And you see there's a little bit, and it's not fully complete into CO2, and you see the same with O2. <coughs> this really has to do with equilibrium, chemical equilibrium that you still have, there's some O2 left.
Does the heating value include energy needed to vaporize the fuel? Normally not. So that's the question. Does the heating value include energy needed to vaporize the fuel? Normally not. It's normally only uh, the, the, the chemical energy. Not only the chemical energy. It can be included, but normally not. So if you look like the adiabatic flame temperature, uh, well, we just saw with the increasing inner temperature, you see also an increase in adiabatic flame temperature. And we see this is for Vs1 is the highest, and for the other one, Vs1.5 and 0.5, so a rich and a lean flame, you see that you have lower adiabatic flame temperature. And you have the same thing on the pressure. You also see an elliptic impact on the pressure. That really has to do with a change of equilibrium and also has to do uh, with the change in, uh, in uh, CP. So there's a, there is some effect, not very big effect, but there is some effect in the pressure on the adiabatic flame temperature, stoichiometric adiabatic flame temperature. Yeah, so these are the, the typical, if you look, for example, in an aircraft engine, you see the air fuel air ratio. Well, we just have the fuel air ratio. Uh, but if you look at the fee, look at that, you see actually that uh, in this case, you have, uh, you're on the lean side and you have about three times as much air as required for uh, complex stoichiometric uh, situations. Depends a little bit what engine you are. That's quite a lot. And that's typically numbers of a gas turbine. You have a factor two to three, too much air. Does anybody know why this equivalence ratio is that far away from stoichiometric in a, in a gas turbine? Why don't we have, why don't we run a gas turbine with an uh, equivalence rate, with, with an equivalent ratio of one? Yeah, I think I see the good temperatures, the turbine inner temperature. That really, it really has to do with the turbine inner temperature. So the turbine inner temperature, so that the material discussed in last uh, classes and the cooling determines the maximum allowable turbine inner temperature. And that really gives the, um, uh, the equivalent ratio uh, the, the total engine is running on. Okay, I think I'll leave it for here at the moment. So we give you five minutes break and we come back in, uh, in five minutes from now.
So we will start in some minutes, in a minute. So let's start again. So just before the break, we ended this, this, this conclusion that about three times as much air in a system, uh, in a gas turbine, uh, than required for complete combustion. And it really has to like the discussion because of turbine inlet temperature, because that really is the thermodynamic system. The maximum turbine inlet temperature really determines the balance between air and, and fuel. If you look a little bit, I will go back, oh, wait a minute. So if you look like there, we an equilibrium ratio of 0.3. So in reality, we will be somewhere here. And actually, if you go a little bit, so this is the stoichiometric, the sort of adiabatic flame temperature is here. So this is stoichiometric flame temperature, stoichiometric flame temperature, adiabatic flame temperature. We go a little bit later, uh, how we can achieve that combination because, well, uh, it looks like it would, would add very up low, low here. Uh, how in reality we achieve that in, in a gas turbine engine. Another thing I won't discuss into detail is, is the worry index. So that's important. Um, uh, you will find it if you look like uh, gas quality and also discussion about gas quality, natural gas for different burners, uh, you went up with the worry index. So in many cases uh, it's, it's next to the lower heating value, but actually the higher heating value, the higher heating value is used for, for, for selling of, of, of fuels. Uh, um, but then you look at the Warby index and the Warby index is really is uh, used to compare different gases fuels. So actually it's stated that if the Warby index is written in a certain range, you can apply that fuel in, in the burner you want to have and the combustion insulation you like to have. And the simple explanation, if you have a, two fuels have the similar Warby index, it's the same LHV or HSV. So you can both have the Warby index on the LHV and the HSV, but you have the same input at the same supply pressure. Uh, so typically allowable variation in the Warby index for a combustion also for an, an gas turbine combustion insulation about plus or minus 5%. And if you do a little bit calculations on the Warby index. I won't do it here, but it really has to do with the pressure drop over the fuel injector. So uh, that, that goes quadratic. So you can work it out that the Warby index is uh, the LHV. So the low heat value in uh, megajoule per norm cube. So not per kilogram, per norm cube, divided by the relative density. And the relative density is the density versus the density of air. So this is an important one here for, for the for the Warby index at the stamp temperature. And then in this situation, um, you can modify the Warby index, and that's important by uh, changing the fuel temperature. So one of the challenges, for example, with combustion dynamics, so if you have a coupling between acoustics and combustion, uh, one of the important aspects is there the Warby index. Uh, because that, 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 that has an influence on, on the coupling between acoustic and combustion. And you can change the Warby index of your fuel by changing the uh, temperature of your fuel supply. So in many cases, I don't know, some people we have worked with gas turbines that have combustion dynamics, you really see that one of the tuning parameters to get rid of the combustion dynamics is to tune this T, the, the, the fuel temperature. So this important one, the Warby index, an important one is really to compare different fuels, gaseous fuels. Okay, a little bit out you know, about combustion theory. There are two types of combustion. Actually, um, it really has to do with the mixture of the fuel and the air, and that's non-premixed and premixed. I think this is the most important distinction between two types of combustion. So in premixed combustion, you Premix the fuel and the air uh, at, at the room temperature or at conditions where they are not reactive. So you have a very first good mixture of fuel and air. And actually, like I said in the beginning, the combustion really takes place at the molecular level. So if you do that premix, well, you 
we you create that the the, the 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 fuel molecules are close to the oxygen molecules before you uh, the combustion takes place. In a non premix situation, uh, also called diffusion, there the fuel and the air, well, they have two separate streams, and then they have to mix, uh, and they have to you know, finally by diffusion, because the molecular diffusion, the, the very air and the fuel have to meet each other. So that's an other type of combustion. And I have the question here. I stop still burning, yeah. Um, if we look at this candle, it's a type of combustion we'll see a lot in the coming days. Uh, is this non premixed or premixed combustion? Does anybody know what kind of combustion you have here? Please keep your answer in your in talk. Diffusion, yes, yeah. so no, yeah, no. Yeah, that's fully true. Um, and um, yeah, okay. What you see here, so actually, this non premixed combustion. So, what you see here, you have the fuel here. This actually the candle is fuel that's heated up by the heat radiation from, from, from the candle that makes the fuel first melt and there after that evaporate. And then it evaporates, so you get the flow of fuel coming up here and also partly suck into this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this black is this, this, this here. And then it, the, the air coming from outside and you get here the interface between the fuel and the air where the combustion takes place. So where it is, those non premix combustion and uh, that, that situation, yeah, I fully agree with you. So this is important one, non premix and premix. Then we have the, the flow, major flow, turbulent and, and laminar. Well, I think when we look at the candle, it's a very laminar flow. If you look at our uh, gas turbine, it's very turbulent. It's like a hurricane flow. It's really 100 meters per second. It's very, it's, it's very turbulent. And that also has some advantages for the combustion. And then with the phase of the fuel and oxidizer, homogeneous and non-homogeneous. So in our case, if you uh, combust natural gas, for example, in a gas turbine, you both in the gaseous phase, so they are here. If you have <coughs> the candle, you see non-homogeneous because you first have evaporated fuel. Also with kerosene in, 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 uh, in an air energy, you have also non-homogeneous. So these are the, 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 these are the main, the main aspects. If you really want to classify combustion in different aspects, these are the first things you can classify combustion into. And how, yeah, we saw it in the beginning, but how does combustion look like? So we just, in the previous hour, we dis discussed the chemical reaction. So there's where the heat release takes place. But before we have the chemical reaction, we need uh, the fuel air mixing because they have to be, uh, the fuel and, mole and air molecules have to be closely together, or actually the fuel and the oxygen molecules have to be closely together. And in the, this case, if you don't have, an, uh, if you're non homogeneous, you also have the, the uh, evaporation of the fuel. So it's a quite a chain, but also very interactive. All this mix is together with turbulent mixture. So in our case, especially if you have a, if you have a turbulent flame, it's all linked to get a turbulent mixture. Well, this one, if you have liquid combustion, you really talk about all these one. So evaporation into heat release, gaseous fuels. Well, you have this one. And if you have premixed, well, you do this in another situation. You go on this one and here. And then you also get all the interaction. So the heat release, that's an important one, affects the chemical reaction. And like you said, you have uh, three elements for combustion, temperature, oxidized fuel. So you need the heat from the heat release fuel to keep this reaction going and to start reaction. Because normally on the left side, you're on the cold, you're colder and you need heat to start reaction, get the reaction going. Now heat release is some event on the fuel air mixing, but surely affect on the evaporation. Now, the evaporation, the fuel air mixing, of course, has some effect on the uh, evaporation. And it's all linked together. So actually, combustion, all these four processes are all together, linked together, and it makes a very complex uh, situation together. We go to premix combustion, and I'd like to discuss this a little bit further. Um,
assume we have a free mix of tube where we have here. I do it in the same way as it done in the slides. So it's not confusing, wait a minute. So we have here products of CH4 plus air. And we have here, sorry, we have, sorry, we have reactants, the products reactants they're called. Reactants. We have here products CO2 plus H2O plus excess air. So normally get the flow coming like this. And we get here, this and combustion font. So we get the flow going like this and here. So what happened did, did the, the chemical reaction take place in this front? So if you look at the, the, the reaction rate, it's normally a very small front. So that the reaction rate is something like whoop, reaction rate. If you look like uh, the amount of CH4, for example, CS4, it goes here. And then we call CH4 at the end is zero. So you get a count of diffusion. You get here a diffusion of CH4 to here. <coughs> if you look at the temperature, that's high here and low in front. So that's sorry, so this. CH4 temperature. So the temperature is high here and low here. So you get the heat flow here. And uh, so, so, uh, and you with the, the products, for example. So if you have the, uh, for example, the, the CO2, is more or less equal to the temperature, CO2, H2O. It goes to here and zero here. There's a little bit maybe upstairs there. So what you see here in such a chemical reaction, so in a an, 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 an premix flame, this is a premix flame, so we have a premix mixture. It's a balance between the chemical reaction and uh, the diffusion of species and temperature. For example, because what happens here, if here the mixture comes up, it's heated up, and then actually the reaction slowly starts when it's past a certain uh, temperature, and also when there are some radicals traveling upstream in that mixture, and then you get a sudden increase in the reaction because you get the exponential Arrhenius reaction rate until everything is consumed and you get a constant temperature again. Very important aspect here, you have to uh, you have to come here with the fuel the speed here. And actually, if this flame font is stationary, you can see that it is a lambda flame speed going that way. It's a concept actually where you have to uh, where you have the flame speed balances uh, the, 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 the incoming flow velocities. Important to know because you have here V in and V out. V out will normally be larger than V1 because of the expansion. Because you have a high temperature, you get a lower density, so you get a high velocity outside here. And this is really about uh, premix combustion. That's really a balance between the diffusion in a laminar case and the, the, the reaction rate. Uh, wait a minute, I see her in question. Uh, she asked me, wait a minute, a couple of days. Um, there's a question related to CFD. Does pre mixed combustion doesn't mean that one doesn't solve for mass transport, just include heat source and fairing properties? Um, I think it's a very detailed question. 
um, we can maybe discuss it offline, but in reality, in premium combustion, you don't have, there is an option and most premium combustion act, models actually, if you have fully premium combustion, most models work like that, that you only have to solve for a reaction progress variable. That's a count, um, a corrected T or a corrected CO2 concentration of something, but that's true. And if you have fully three premium combustion, you don't have to solve for all, all situations. But you can, if you have a simplified model, you can work with one reaction progress variable. So this is the same uh, picture I just saw is, is really where you have the, this, the temperature increases and then you have the preheating zone. And the preheating zone, that is very important because we just saw to have combustion, you need uh, oxidized fuel and heat. So you need this preheating to start the combustion in this zone, otherwise you won't have combustion. So you need to have an upstream diffusion of, of temperature or of heat to start a combustion. And you also like to have an uh, upstream uh, uh, diffusion of uh, radicals also that also en enables the combustion. There's the fuel like we saw, and here the temperature in uh, the profession increase. A very important here like is the, the laminar flame speed. If you look non pre mixed combustion, There is a little bit different. There you start in this case on the, on the left side on the pure oxidized, on the Y side on the pure fuel. And then, so if you won't have uh, uh, any combustion, you will have here a normal uh, mixing layer between them where you get here diffusion of fuel. Uh, so the fuel concentration uh, goes from zero to one in the, in the fuel concentration, the air goes the other way around. But in reality, what happens if, if they add stoichiometric conditions, there the combustion takes place. So you have those mixing during here and add stoichiometric conditions because there you have the highest flame temperature and the highest flame speed. There you will have the combustion taking place. So in this case, that's very important to know that you have here the uh, amount of fuel amount of air. In this case, Always, if you have non pre mixed combustion, the combustion interface will be where will be the highest flow velocity, the highest uh, uh, flame speed, and that is really with the highest flame temperature and it's at the stoichiometric interface. So, in non pre mixed combustion, this is very important, the combustion takes place at the stoichiometric ratio. In pre mixed combustion, the combustion takes place at well at the, the stoichiometric ratio or the, the, the equivalent ratio you supply. So here it always takes place at VS1, and at the, non, at the premium situation, it, is, it takes place at the V you specify. So that's important. This is the main difference between, uh, there's a very important difference between uh, uh, non premixed and premixed. Now you can have all situations like this, but we just the same situation here. So if we make it in words, we can summarize it like this. So in premix, we have premix of fuel and air at lower temperatures, not the combustion temperatures, much lower temperatures so before the end of the combustion. So the flame front is really a, a balance between the flow, and in our case, the turbine flame velocity and the laminar flame, the laminar flame velocity. And the laminar flame velocity is determined by the balance between the, the, the reaction rate and the diffusion. And um, well, the, the, the equivalent ratio, so that the V determines the flame temperature. If you look at non premix combustion, so separate entry fuel air in the combustor, and then the flame font is always at the stoichiometric interface, the stoichiometric mixing zone. And so the, the, the temperature, so that the flame temperature is there at the interface between the fuel and air. So if, if we have this difference between non premixed and premixed combustion, does anybody know can mention some advantages of premixed combustion versus non premixed? Why would you why would you like to use premixed versus non premixed? The question is: Can we state that the flame temperature of non premixed high? Yes, the temperature at which the reaction takes place is higher in non-premix. Yeah. 
we have premium and value here, okay. I see a number of answers. So my question was, what is the advantage of non-premixed versus premixed? So we have the first uh, question, the answer is premixed is more complete. I don't understand that. Premixed is lower NOx emissions. We come back to the later, that's true, but it's not advantage of non-premixed. And I'm looking at advantage of non-premixed. Um, less than combust fuel, I don't know, I don't understand that one, less than combust fuel, less non combust fuel, non premix less non combust fuel. Ah, okay. Uh, with non premix because you have a high flame temperature, that's true, you have a higher flame velocity. It can be a balance if you have it premix or you have low uh, temperature zones, you can't have an incomplete, you can have incomplete combustion. That can be a challenge of premix. If you have a good combustion system, it's not true, but if you have a not a good designed combustion system, you have incomplete combustion. Non premixed is safe for flashback. Yeah, that's true. I think this non premixed is um, more stable. Yeah, and that's one of the main reasons. Non premixed is more stable. And the reason why it's more stable is because it has the higher flame temperature. You always have there the zone with the high flame temperature, with the stoichiometric flame temperature. And because of this higher flame temperature, you have a much more stable flame. So you see that in a lot of land-based gas turbines, they have a small non-premix flame um, to really see, uh, to stabilize a big premix flame. What you also see is in uh, aircraft engines, they run on non-premix combustion because non-premix is more stable than premix combustion. It's all together with the kerosene, but therefore you really have for flame stability, you always want uh, non-premix combustion. The other challenge, if you look at, uh, for example, in the gas turbine, we saw we are running more or less an equivalent, total equivalent ratio of uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, somewhere in between there. You saw in the previous picture that that leads to quite a low uh, uh, flame speed. And uh, therefore, if you do simply premix combustion in a standard combustion in the gas turbine, you should be very careful with that. If you have an excess, too high excess of air, you don't have a, a stable premix flame. But if you have a, an, you can have a, 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 a non premix flame where we just have the flame and the, 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 the excess of air is just flowing around it. So it's not interact, directly interacting with the flame. Where if you have in a premix flame, that excess of air reduces the flame temperature and therefore the flame's temperature, the flame st stability. So with non premix, you normally use it to, for stable flame because of the high temperature and less sensitivity for the amount of air. Okay. Then actually, yeah, we don't go in detail, but in reality, we, we just had the, the one-step reaction in the chemical equilibrium. Well, this is bound, a kind of reaction mechanism, all kind of uh, uh, intermediates in between, all kind of uh, chemical intermediate species, uh, radicals, and that really, you also see they also go back, for example, here, to start the reaction. So there are chain breaking reactions, stage charging reactions, things like that. So in reality, we now make a simple one, but in reality is a very complex reaction mechanism. We don't go in detail. You can follow the aerospace class on combustion to get more details about this. Then you have the chemical reaction rate, and that's actually the Arrhenius equation. And therefore, the temperature is very important. Um, so these are the typical reaction rate. We don't go in detail, but to really see that uh, um, uh, the, the, the reaction rate grows exponentially with the temperature. So with low temperatures, you don't have any uh, reaction rate and with high temperatures, a very high temperature, a very high reaction rate. And that's really linked to combustion. You need that high temperature to get the combustion, to, to get uh, the combustion started. And the high temperature is also linked to the, the, the creation of radicals and things like that. So it's all linked together a little bit here, but it's important here, the high temperature. Yeah, so we, 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 I just introduced the concept of flame speed. So the flame speed, the laminar flame speed gives the balance uh, between, uh, um, uh, so, so the laminar flame speed is, is, is the balance between a chemical reaction rate and the diffusion of the species and temperature. So if you look at different equivalence ratio, this for methane on uh, uh, room conditions, you can uh, uh, distract the uh, laminar flame speed. Well, the, I now included a number of either measurements and all kinds of calculations and things like that. And you see in all cases, 
the laminar flame speed for, uh, I think it's for most uh, situations, is really actually if the equivalent ratio one is the highest and then decrease significantly if you go to lower equivalence ratios. And that's one of the challenges if you have, so if you have non premix combustion, you are here with the highest equivalence ratio and highest flame speed. If you are in lean condition in gas turbine, you end up here with potentially very low flame speed. So if you really want, and that's really, you can have challenges uh, with your stability of low flame speed. <coughs> no, actually, they all have their uh, flame speed at their stoichiometric ratio. So this is a laminar situation here. This is a laminar, simple laminar flame. We just actually what we just saw is that that flame front we saw propagating in a pipe. The very simple uh, academic situation. In reality, we have much more complex, and we talk about uh, turbulent flame front. And this is what happens in a turbulent flame front, and also in a gas turbine. Uh, this is the kind of Borghi diagram of the page, page diagram. And it really gives uh, their number, you don't have to know by head, but I really want to discuss it uh, to, to give some more uh, details about. So what happens, how can you describe such a flame in such a uh, combustor? Uh, important aspects are um, the ratio of the U prime, so the art of velocity fluctuation due to turbulence versus the uh, laminar flame speed. So if you get, uh, if it becomes higher, it goes in this direction, you get more and more flame front like this. And really what it see is that actually the flame front uh, is, uh, that the flame surface area is increased by the turbulence because the turbulence really like you show here, the turbulent eddy really dis deform the flame front area. Okay, so it, in this picture quite clear, the eddies of the turbulence really deform the flame front area. And because you get an increase in the flame front area, and at all those locations in the flame front area, you have the laminar flame spot because you got a lower area, a higher area, so a higher area times the same, same laminar flame speed, you get a higher velocity. So this is at uh, me low to medium turbulence, you really get this kind where you get the flame front is, uh, is uh, uh, influenced by the, uh, the turbulence. If you really go to a very high turbulence, then the small turbulent eddies become of the size of the flame front. So they also in, intensify the mixing in the flame front. In this case, the mixing in the flame front is really just the laminar, so the diffusion. But in this case, you get all small, uh, small, uh, small eddies who interact in the flame front. And therefore you get a further increase in, 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 uh, in turbulent uh, flame speed. So it's really, um, um, in the first instance, from low to medium turbulence, you can really describe the turbulence. Uh, uh, you can really describe the turbulent combustion as a modified laminar combustion, where the, actually the, the flame surface area is modified. And if you go to a higher uh, turbulence, in this case, you really get all kinds of small turbulent reactors that even further increase the turbulent uh, uh, reaction rate. Gas turbine combustion are a little bit in between. So really, they are really mostly in this, uh, this uh, wrinkled and uh, thin reaction zone flame front. But in some cases, they can also end into this, the uh, distributed reaction flame front. <coughs> there are some other interactions it's really on the flame front. Uh, you can also get some stretch and other effects. We don't discuss them here. Uh, uh, that also affected the, the turbulent combustion. It can even uh, yeah, decrease the laminar flame speed locally. But they don't discuss here. This is the basic principle that turbulence increase the uh, flame surface area, and thereby increase the, 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 the flame speed. So you have some other things here. Like I said, the stretch mixing for low and high turbulence. And these are some aspects. And uh, you can, for example, if you look like uh, this ratio, so the U prime of SL, so that the turbulent fluctuations versus the uh, laminar flame speed. And you look here, the turbulent flame speed first laminar flame speed, you see the factor are, are 20. In this situation, you go even to a factor of 30 or 40. <coughs> Important to know that a turbulent um, um, flame speed is a concept. It's not a reality, it's a concept to describe the flame. It's used in a, bad, in a lot of situation, 
but it's really a concept to see how much, how fast do, do the flame uh, propagate. And you see it also used in a lot of combustion models, the, this, the turbulent flame speed closure models, but it's, it's a kind of concept. In reality, it's really a balance between mixing and reaction, but it, it, it can, be, can be described with the turbulent flame speed. Oh, wait a minute. I see an issue right in the web, something. So if we make a small summary. So we have to, so we need three things for uh, combustion, fuel, oxidizer, and, and temperature. Well, the temperature goes exponential. So the higher temperature, the higher the reaction rate goes. Near the equivalence ratio. So that at V is one, we have the highest chemical reaction rate, the highest flame speed, and it goes lower uh, at higher and lower V. And we get the pressure also increase. Turbulence increase the flame speed up to factor 100. So that's mainly due to the change in the uh, turbulent area. And uh, we also have a kind of minimum initial temperature required to start combustion. So that's a minimum combustion temperature. So if we look and design of the installation, these are the things we have to discuss. Flame stabilization, blow off and flashback, uh, ignition, relight, burn out, like we said, incomplete combustion, NOx emissions, cooling, and things like that. Okay, and flame stabilization, um, important and really for flame stabilization, and that's the basis for all kind of burner design is we need a flame anchor. And uh, the Americans really talk about an anchor in all combustors, all gas turbine combustors, you need an anchor. And you need a reliable anchor. Also, if you have load variations, you want to have there an anchor to have a stable combustion. And there are two main uh, situations to create such a hot zone. First of all, is with aerodynamic recirculation of hot combustion products. And that's one of the reasons normally swirl burners are used in, in uh, gas turbine combustors because they're very intense, intense missing, but also because of swirl is you get internal recirculation. So you get a recirculation of the hot gases to the inlet. Thereby you create local high temperature zones where you can stabilize the combustor. And like we just discussed, you all normally also uh, non premix flames, sometimes small or sometimes bigger, are used to create a hot zone for stabilization. And they are called uh, the pilot flame. So if you really want to have this, this, this flame anchor, you have the non premix pilot flame. You want to have the local the reduction of flow velocity so you get their stable combustion. You can play with the equivalent ratio and can play with the, with the, with the air temperature. So this is very important in, in all kinds of burns, they have this a kind of, of, of flame zone. If you go a little bit back to our situation uh, from the uh, uh, aircraft engine, we saw we, we were running with a fee of 0.3 overall. Does anybody know how is normally uh, the high stable zone in these uh, aero engines created. Does anybody have an idea about that? How do we create such a stable zone in um, in aero engines? What tricks are they using for that? Pressure control could be. Other questions, other suggestions? How do they create a hot zone in a combustor in an aero engine? Not premix flame, yeah, okay, come back, yeah. So I see adjusting the size of the fuel inlet, non premix flame. Well, they have non premix flame in air engines, yeah, there is still another trick that's applied to create locally a um, uh, uh, um, stable zone with the cooling air, more or less, yeah. Let's go a little bit back because that's true. It's, 
we go a little bit back in our slides. Go quite back. Here, now I think this one is even better. This one. Yes, this one. What you see here, in this case, the combustion takes place here, and here you have those holes. So what happens in this situation is um, if the air comes from here, only a, a part of the air enters through these holes, and these are called dilution holes, and they go, actually they're only used for cooling. So part of the air, only part of the air goes to the end of the combustor, where the combustion takes place. So on this hot end of the combustor, you have less air, and air is gradually added, so you cool down until you reach the right turbine inner temperature. So by not adding all the air uh, at the fuel, you can create here a hotter zone, so a more stable zone. And then adding later on the air to it, you get uh, for the turbine inner temperature. So that's the very reason they do it, by not adding all the air for the combustion. And you see it here, these are called the dilution holes. So only part of the air goes to the combustor, and the rest is more downstream added via dilution holes. You also see it very clearly here. So the air flows around this situation, around this situation. Part of the air goes up around this. So that this air never reached the combustion zone. Only part of the air goes around it and enters here the combustion zone and is used for combustion. And the rest of the air, so the is, is added here to get the right turbine in that temperature. The situation. That's a trick that used normally in aero engines. You see it here also. These are therefore these are also called dilution zone holes. See it all here. It's important. And it is really the mix between at what temperature you have the combustion and at what temperature is uh, you can have the turbine in a temperature. That's the balance. So if you have a high temperature combustion and a low temperature turbine in a temperature, you have a lot of dilution air, a lot of dilution holes. And then you have some tricks where you can do the most one. This is a little bit the, 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 the riddle, but normally you use swirl by getting those internal recirculation zones. And this is really, if you look like a, such a situation, so we get the air coming from here, part, only part of the air is used for this combustor to primary zone, and you get more dilution air to get the right temperature for the end of this turbine. Yeah, if you have uh, premix combustion, you also have the pilot flame. So then, for example, in this case, this is an example of a GE engine. But what happens in this case is that you have here, the air flows around uh, this situation. The air flows here, goes around the corner here. Then you have a uh, number of free mixers where fuel is injected. There's a premixing chamber. So it's pre-mixed here. Then there's a venturi for the acceleration. And then uh, you get a pilot flame here in the center. So it's a non pre flame that stabilizes the big pre flame. So in this way, you, you calculate the hot zone to stabilize the big pre flame. And that situation, you can achieve both low NOx and CO. Uh, yeah, so yeah. stable combustion, well, the equivalent ratio. Um, you have kind of this crop, so you have to, if you have the air mass flow, you have the stable flow. Uh, so equivalent ratio one. And if you have a tulum heart air, air mass flow, you get extinction that also has to do with stress and things like that. Uh, and but uh, you can really operate between in this situation here. Okay. NOx, we go back to NOx. Uh, NOx is one of the products, main, one of the uh, challenges for, for combustion. And uh, it is nitric oxides. Um, so it's toxic. It's a precursor of chemical smog. So it gets rid of this brown yellow uh, area. Uh, depletion of ozone in the atmosphere and precursor of acid rain. So it's really quite, really, there are a lot of stringent regulations, especially in. Uh, in a dense uh, populated area to limit uh, the amount of NOx. 
And uh, you see a difference here. It's uh, you see it here NO2 plume. Actually, you have NOx because it's called NOx because you have NO and NO2. And it really depends a little bit on the conservation of combustion resonance time and things like that. If you perform, if you form more NO or NO2, but normally NO2 is visible. They are just as harmful, but NO2 is more visible. So there are some tricks to shift from NO2 to NO. But here I see so typically NO2 from an uh, from an installation. Um, that's uh, the, the European legislation, US legislation is a typical new legislation. So the next legislation, I think this is now, I think I should update it because in July coming year, we now have new legislation for this. And NOx formation, um, you have three mechanisms, mainly three mechanisms. So you have fuel bound NOx. So if you have nitrogen in fuel, that will be oxidized and converted in, in, into NOx. You have prone NOx, where you also have some between the radicals. You see some radicals from the combustion, for example, CH4, you can also form NOx. And then you have the thermal NOx. And this is for uh, gas turbines, the most relevant one. It's called the cold cell defeat mechanism. And it really gets very relevant at high temperatures. So the higher the temperatures, the higher the NOx emissions is. So if you look like here, this is a kind of uh, formulation. So the NOx formation is the residence time and the temperature. Uh, so different temperatures, you see there's a very significant increase in NOx. That's important here. So for NOx is temperature residence time, the equivalence ratio, the presence of H2 and the presence of OH radical. And how could we prevent NOx? And I think this is something very important. That's one of the main triggers for the uh, recent switch to, now recent about the last two decades, switch to premix combustion, because in premix combustion, you can control the flame temperature, so this one, and therefore you can control the NOx. So by having this premix combustion, you can uh, do that. Some other things are to, to reduce the NOx, are use either steam or water injection. So in conventional combustion, so you have non-premixed conventional combustors, you can use steam or water injection. You just inject steam or water into the flame. And therefore it has two effects. The first main effect, it decreases the temperature. And the second effect, it also uh, changes the presence of LH radicals. So thin steam and water injection can be very effective to reduce NOx. Uh, the disadvantage it normally is not that good for the hardware. So you have a shorter lifetime of your combustion hardware. Another thing you can also do, and uh, we also studying that at TU Delft, is to if you, if you recirculate the flue gas partly uh, over the system, you reduce the amount of O2 in the system. So oxygen in the system. And if you have less oxygen in the system, yeah, you see it's also in the O, you will have uh, less uh, drive to, for NOx formation. So internal flue gas recirculation with ice might also an option to reduce NOx. It also has partly effect of the low flame temperature. It can either be internal or external flue gas recirculation. So these are the four main methods to reduce NOx formation from combustion. And if you nowadays look at modern gas turbine engines, they normally use premix combustion. And this is a typical diagram. Um, and it's really to understand. So what happens here? You really try to control uh, your um, uh, combustion temperature. And I think this is typical numbers, but it depends a little bit in, in, in the, 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 the pressure rate and things like that within this area. So the, the premix temperature, you really want to control this in this area. If you get a too high adiabatic flame temperature, so a high equivalent ratio, you get high NOx. If you get a too low flame temperature, you got incomplete combustion and incomplete combustion, you can see with CO. What also happens if you have go to high, higher uh, adiabatic flame temperatures, you can even have also have XCO formation that really has to do with, with, with equilibrium of, of CO. So really where you want to be in a, 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 a low NOx burner, in a premix burner, you really want to operate in this area. And you see, it's quite a limited operational area where you can operate in. If you, uh, well, for example, if you look at the homework assignments and the other situations, this is also more or less linked to the turbine in the temperature. So you have only a very limited range of 
stable temperatures where you have both low NOx and stable combustion. So that's really the trick with, uh, with premium combustion. You have a very small sound of a stable combustion. And that makes it quite complex to system uh, to develop and to operate. But you really need, you, you get very active, uh, very effective NOx reduction in such a system. And that's something like I said here. So for example, if you look at this typically for a DE engine, this is the situation uh, where you control uh, the, the air mass flow by, by the inlet guide phase. And actually you control the turbine inlet temperature to the combustion. And uh, you can imagine if you control the turbine inlet temperature, actually the only uh, equipment between the turbine and the combustor is the transition piece. So it has very little impact on the, uh, on the temperature. So you also control in this case, the, uh, the, the, the flame temperature. So only where you have this high flame temperature and you are in this region for the, for the NOx, you can have apply premix combustion. So in this case, for this, this, this situation, but typically for a little bit the older gas turbines, you can only uh, run uh, this, 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 this situation in premix mode above 80% operation. So where you, have a con where you control the air mass flow by the IGVs, and this way have a constant turbine inner temperature, turbine flame temperature. At lower flame temperatures, so if you go further to part load, you decrease the flame temperature. And if you decrease the flame temperature, sorry, you go to the left in this situation, and then you enter with unstable combustion. So you have high CO. Well, the high CO is the first indication, but it means incomplete combustion. So you don't get any combustion reaction anymore. So you miss the temperature in your combustion uh, triangle. And therefore, you have to go to a kind of uh, primary that's actually fully premixed, and the dean is a combination of uh, premixed and non premixed. So you really see here, that's really the challenge in this situation. And in this case, we have the low NOx and low CO. You see here, CO is increasing here, and then you switch to, the, to these modes. And that's the challenge with premixed combustion. You only have a small operational range. And there are a number of tricks to do that. So switch off burners and things like that. But that's really the challenge with premixed combustion, how to operate over a, a large range of, uh, op a large operational range. Uh, this is about premixed. Well, we can very briefly, I don't about cooling. Well, I skipped this for today because then you can burn a design. Yeah, this actually lightly discussed uh, a little bit further. So we had here the atmospheric burner, but uh, you get here that this is the kind of uh, analog combustor. So the flow around here, you get here the burner around here. This is the aerodynamics. If you go to lean premix combustion, so that's maybe more important for us. So we want to have stable flame, we just discussed. We want to have the flame blow out, but also we want to prevent flashback. And actually, flame blowout is a too low flame velocity, and flame flashback is a too high flame velocity. So actually, that the flame velocity becomes higher than the incoming speed, you get an issue. And especially too with hydrogen, that has a very flame high flame velocity, but also with uh, uh, natural gas, you've designed a burn for that. You have to burn out, so you have complete combustion, low NOx, combustibilities, and off design operation. We actually already discussed that a little bit. So we saw this picture where we get the flame stabilization with, the, with the, the, the pilot flame to get to create the hot zone. And this is actually um, all premix flames uh, burners look a little bit like this. Uh, this is very simplified, but they, they really have something like this. So you have the air and the fuel. They are injected, so a cross flow or somewhere or the other. Then there's a swirl in the same area. Sometimes they are combined, the, the premixer and the swirler. Then you have a kind of premixer zone. So you give the air and the fuel so time to premix. And then uh, you have here normally a an, uh, an, an, uh, contraction uh, to accelerate the flow and to prevent flashback. So you create a higher speed outside of the burner than the uh, laminar, than the turbulent flame speed. And then you get here the flame. And because of the swirl, you normally get the recirculation to create uh, the reignition again, to really get the reignition. 
So this is the Siemens burner. You see here, there's an old, yes, the, 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 the standard Siemens burner. So you see the, here the, the, the fuel injectors, you see the contraction, and there's some time here to, uh, to mix the fuel and the air. And in the center, you have the pilot burner to, to stabilize the flame. Mm -hmm. These are kind of uh, low NOx, the, the, the GE burners. So they have uh, five, in this case, six premixers, five and around one in the center, and all premixers look like that. So this one is inside this tube. So this is somewhere around here. And you see here is a combination of fuel injectors and swirl, and there uh, the flow goes, and there's a premixer. And this one is the non premix flame you can use for flame stabilization or for part of the operation. And by using these five premixers or five plus one premixers, uh, you can switch off burners during various modes of operation, and their way you can also assure uh, flame stability for the different situations. So at full load, they're all burning, and at part load, you switch off part of the burners or switch part of the burners to from premix to non-premix combustion. So at lower flame, of lower turbine inner temperatures. Uh, so we discussed this, stable to raise flame velocity, so requiring stable premix operation, the flame temperature is important here, the velocity, flame temperature there with the laminar flame speed, the velocity, the balance and stabilization uh, of design operation. Well, uh, the fuel staging, so you can switch from premix to non-premix about below 70 to 80%. You can also have some tricks to blow off or to recirculate compressor inlet air by recirculation compressor inlet air. Uh, you uh, increase the temperature and you can do some air staging variable geometry. So you can also, there are some uh, combustors uh, where you can bypass the combustor at low loads uh, to, not, to prevent of all airflow going to the, to the, uh, to, to the, to the pre-mixer. So in this system we just discussed, actually we had this picture I just discussed around here and that's the DLN1 from, from GE. And you really see it's only partly a premix here and all kind of partly premix diffusion primary only diffusion only at, at part load. That's the normal way they do here. The distance system, well, this is an, uh, a DLN system. You need about, well, in this case, this situation, you actually have two, two fuel entries. So one for the, the diesel outer burner, one for the central burner. In other cases, this situation has four fuel manifolds. So you have four different uh, fuel uh, manifolds to, to connect to, to the combustors to really get it work. Okay, I think this was the main things I like to discuss. There are some more information about combustion dynamics and uh, hydrogen combustion. I think it's well, we're already two hours running. So I'd like to stop it by now. Are there any questions? No, then uh, otherwise uh, I'd like to stop the class here. Um, um, so if no other questions, are there some questions related to the homework assignment? No, I don't see any feedback. Then I'd like to wish you all the best uh, days for, for Christmas. Wish you a Merry Christmas and, and uh, a good, New Year, and we see it's all our, I think the Tuesday in January, I don't know the date. We will see what date it is. So January the uh, 5th. So January the 5th, we have the next uh, uh, class. Okay, I wish you Merry Christmas and uh, see you all around. Thank you. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. Thanks. Happy holidays. Happy Bye -bye. holidays. Bye-bye. Have a nice Bye -bye. Christmas.